Hello and welcome back to Ollie Talks Airsoft. Today I'm here with Alex and we're just going to be doing some general chat about airsoft stuff. Now, I've already filmed the chat um, and the cameras, uh, I've got two cameras now and they keep on dying. And so it's going to switch between the two cameras as we kind of go through. But hopefully you enjoy this little um, fly on the wall to geeks talking about airsoft <laughs> and airsoft related rambling things and playing with a couple of little toys that you can kind of maybe see a little bit of in the background here. Anyway, hope you enjoy. Here we go. There is probably a good reason that people specialise in TM rather than, <clears throat> not to sound too much of a fanboy, but they are first and foremost airsoft guns mm. and secondly like riffs, you know, mm. secondly meant to look like a real gun but the the main function of it is an airsoft gun yeah i mean even like technically the most recent gas blowback release the akx that's not based on a real gun no. like, especially like the locking system at the back of the um yeah where is it? it's back there um Very much like all tm proprietary i don't think i don't believe it's based off of anything yeah exactly but yet, as a functional airsoft gun, it is superb. Mm. Like, the AK series having that larger cylinder, and if you don't, you know, if you're gonna upgrade and you wanna do like a full Zenico build or something like that, then go buy the AKM, because it's cheaper and you're gonna strip everything off it anyway, so yeah. it doesn't matter. But if you want something out of the box that performs exactly the same as the AKM, so you get that like improved cold weather performance because of the larger, cylinder mm. like the larger nozzle um and you can just attach whatever you want on it and make it short just it's dynamite it's really good um i genuinely if someone was wondering what to buy i'd say this because i would as well aftermarket kits are actually really expensive well it it brings it up to the same cost as just buying this anyway yeah because like Angry Gun Kits, her face has just came out with a bunch of stuff. The, her face just were bang bang and mm. they had like a product launch day and I like went in and didn't really bother with it. It was like too awkward. Mm. But they were just like, had all their stuff there, I don't know, they did stuff like that. No way. <laughs> it was quite cool. It's cool. But yeah, like new front ends, new barrels. It's lovely. I think some stuff's steel, although I don't think it is actually, I think it's aluminium. It's so expensive. The Angry Gun, I want to say Sega, but it's not. It's like their monolithic sag, something. It's just like a monolithic rail, and it's like, by the time it goes to the UK, it's 300 quid. Oh, well, I think it's a front end kit, so you get a barrel and everything, but it's a lot on top of the AKM. Again, taking UK, you know, in Hong Kong or wherever, there's so much. Yeah, and to be fair, like, that aero precision rail that I bought was. I would say it was like £200 delivered or mm. £210 delivered mm. when it eventually gets delivered mm. for the uh, MWS PDW build I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. Which is going to be a lot of fun. In the works. In the works, indeed. AKM, unless you want to duct tape the torch to the outside of it, you can't attach anything to it. And you, it's yeah. Sort of AKM style. I it guess. is. Um, it is. If you're going full hog, just get the wood kit. Steel barrel, steel receiver, you're sort of done. You wouldn't be looking at like, I guess. It was like the Robin Hood one, wasn't it? it yeah. Was like 200, 200 pounds. Probably delivered it would cost about 250 quid. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, you wouldn't be looking at modern handguards anyway. It's the fact that there's no wobble in this either. No, it's so solid. That, this whole wedge piece here, this back piece. I wish they sold this back piece like on its own. Because even the modern ones, like the Ditac one, OMG one, whatever that one is, you don't have this locking piece, which would be so cool. And it, it extends this a little bit further as well, which is quite nice. Yeah, I do. I really like it, to be honest. Yeah. I, I do. It gets more use, definitely, than the AKM that I've got. As yeah. much as I love the wood kit and the actual styling of the AKM, I think is obviously it's very classic. But this is so rock solid and it functions so well. I just it's just brilliant like out of the box it's just I don't think there is I 
think it's probably the best Tokyo Marine gas blowback rifle out of the box. Um, with the exception, maybe, of the MWS. Uh, but the MWS has got 50 mil extra on the inner barrel length. Yeah. So the MWS is 250 mil, whereas this is 200. 200. So you do notice that when you're doing like shooting at range. Mm. But to be honest, like most of shooting at range is to do with using high quality heavyweight ammo. Like, that is what makes the biggest difference and being able to hop that ammo. And so ultimately, if you get like one of the Bav Tackle Jaeger Precision nubs to go in one of these, you can hop heavier BBs and you can get those extended ranges out to like 60, 70 meters. Mm. You, you can do that. But because ultimately range isn't dependent on your inner barrel length. No. Like that sort of, it somewhat comes into like the accuracy of the weapon. Yeah. But it's not conducive to range. Yeah, the actual range is all generated like with the hop up and like getting that backspin on the BB. Mm. I mean, you can get incredible range out of a tiny barrel, but I mean, you wouldn't hit a barn door at 100 yards, yeah. but you might still get there. You know, you might still be able to achieve those like extended ranges, but just won't have that accuracy. And that's where like the MWS comes in so well as like a DMR type platform. Mm. Whereas one of these, they don't really lend themselves to that. But I always think like an AK isn't, it's more an ambush weapon. Yeah. Like it's more for not. It's more for when you're playing like op four, so you don't necessarily want it to be the precision weapon. Like my MWS basically always stays on semi, mm. whereas the AK will actually get flicked onto full auto. And the fact that it handles full auto so well, just it's Mr. Duffo has done a bunch of videos of him using the AK in the cold, mm. like literally in the snow. And you're still seeing him like running it and running it and running it. And it's just like testament to how much of a difference that enlarged cylinder like does. Like how much of a difference that makes, you know? Yeah. But yeah, the, other than the fact that it's not actually based on <clears throat> any like real life weapon system, mm. I just still think it's awesome. Let me show it to the... Uh, Shift the camera a little bit. I think you can get past <laughs> that though. Same as like, people love the MTR. This thing is just dynamite. So it's a real Unity mount, an Enlaw uh, ACOG. So that's from an Enlaw rocket launcher. Super cool. You've got one of these, haven't you? Somewhere? I thought you used to have one. I really wanted um, one, but. But you see them pop up every so often on eBay. Yeah. Um, but in order to throw it back a bit, because you can never find the mount that goes on the front, no. in order to throw it back, I put it on this Unity mount, which I is really nice. I've got a fake Unity mount as well. And <clears throat> the anodizing on this is so much nicer and so much cleaner. Yeah. Um, then obviously I've got the Zenico style like, charging handle. In here, I've got either the Bowmaster or the Hephaestus recoil spring, nice. which is kind of a kind of a must with one of these. Uh, they're so lackluster when you first buy them. Both the like both the AKs are internally identical, mm. um, but yeah, it's just so lackluster that actually just putting that 130 percent or whatever spring in there just just makes the whole thing just feel like way way better. Um, GMP D ball, yeah, very cool. And the fact that you've got this little step down as well, it does make a difference, and it helps obviously, the, you know, to be able to clear. So I'm not actually picking up any of the D ball as I'm looking through this. Like it's, I really hope that TM come out with a 74U. Because they've come out with the Bakelite style mags, but they are so expensive. I know. They're like 70, 80 pounds. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That was like GHK CO2 mag kind of price. And all it is, is just a, a different colour. Yeah. Like it's still made, I think it's still made of aloe. It's not like, it's not oh, a shell really? casing or anything. It's just an aloe that's got just the right paint or the right sort of print on it. Print and texture on it to make it look like Bakelite. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah, TM wouldn't go amiss by doing a 74. It'd be simple for them to do, but I would hope that they would do the changes to uh, the receiver as well. I think they'd have to. Um, and just bring that in, because then 
ultimately, you know, people love picking up a TM because it shoots really well out of the box. They know it's going to be like a really decent hop up and a good gas delivery system. Mm. But then after that, it's the modding world where it really comes in. And it's like, what do you start then attaching on here? It's like real steel. Like this is a real steel Arasaka mount. The only real steel parts on here, I guess, are this little grip that I've got. It's all this sort of hand stop that I've got. Um, it is a fake uh, Surefire M300, but on a real Arasaka uh, mount. And then obviously a fake D-ball, and then with a real Triticon and a real riser. And a, I guess a Ferro Concepts uh, Slingster. Slingster. And I think this is Blue Force gear hardware that I've got on here. So there's a few like real steel bits on here, but not a lot really. Um, no. Not like the MWS, where you where we both had the pleasure of putting like real steel handguards, real, yeah. real buffer tubes, um, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. And you've put what have you? You've had Noveski handguards, Noveski, ECM, guy, uh, ALG, Geisley. ALG is a cool one as well, actually, because that's sort of the oh. sister company of Geisley, isn't it? And yeah, they. You got you had that like seven or eight years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Long, long time ago, and long time ago. when no one has really heard of them, and actually, weirdly, they've come into prominence. I've heard people talking about ALG a lot on their triggers. Yeah, I more think. recently in the last sort of six months to a year. Yeah, uh, people have been sort of back on ALG again. Have you still got that rail? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's a shame because the top is like the tube, so the top hasn't got a pick rail, and I don't think they sell it anymore. I think they outdated that system a while ago. But it's um, really solid. It is really, really nice. Technically, both of my guises are now outdated, so I've got a Mark II Mod 1. Yeah. Which, in nine nine and a half inch, which is apparently Bill Geisley's favourite rail that they ever came out with. Mm. Even though it's knackered, it's so solid. Mm. On my Mark 18, is unbelievable. I think that was what started a bit of a journey Yeah. down like modding <coughs> real steel. And then the second rail that I got was the Mark 13 and they don't make that anymore either. I don't think they do. And it's, it's all sort of Mark 8s, Mark 4s, um, Mark 16s, like UIGI basically. Yeah. And they've, everything is converted over to that. So I've actually got two Geisy rails now that you can't get. And it was funny because the 13 inch um, DDC Mark 13 was exactly what I wanted, and that's exactly what <laughs> came up for sale. Yeah, from um, Ditac. From Ditac. And yeah, the only thing was when it came, it had that powder on it from where they'd 3D scanned, 3D scanned it. So that Which is funny because they never made a rep. Yeah, the, the, so I know that Ditac definitely have a replica, like a perfect replica like for Mark 13 to do it. rail. They just never did. But they just never came out of it. Um, yeah, because you got the Mark Eight, didn't you? Is it was it a Mark Eight? I think I thought it was a Mark Eight. A uh, Mark Eight, or Mark Seven. I can't remember. I want to say Mark Seven. That rail. I'm not sure. Either way, yeah. Now, I, I'm pretty sure. Was the Mark Seven not almost like a Daniel Defence? I'm not sure. Let's have a quick look. Um, oh no. Okay, yeah, connected right. Um, Uh, Mark 7. Oh, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Mark 7 is like it is a Mark Dan Daniel Defence style. That's cool, though. That'd be so heavy. Oh, my God, yeah, it would be heavy and... But the most solid core. Real nice. But even, look, even on the Geisy website, so, look, that's what you had. Yeah, just 13... 13 inch, 13.5. But if you go on here, on the guys' website, and you do Mark 13, hit enter. Nothing. It's just not even on here. Because the Mark 14 came out, your, even the way <coughs> your bolts are staggered, it's so close to the URGI, ultimately the URGI probably just took over. People didn't basically want uh, the Picatinny uh, on the uh, six, nine, yeah. and 3. Um, they wanted to be able to just, you know, they were like, look, if I want pick there, I'll attach it. Yeah. Which is fair. But I always thought it, it, it looks really good. It does, yeah. And... That's why the L11 982 is really cool. I've always liked it because of it. It is so cool, isn't it? It's that, like, monolithic look. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, it is. It's not just the look. It is monolithic. Yeah. <laughs> the look of monolithic. Yeah. <clears throat> That's so cool. Um, should we chuck this back here? Yeah. For a sec? Um, but yeah, what else would like other things that I'd like to see from TM? Scar, obviously. Yeah, guns because on. anything that would take a five five six, anything that would take an MWS mag. Basically. Ultimately, ultimately, like it's done. Like they know what to make. They know how to produce it because they know what system it will be based off of. Roughly, trigger will be different. Bolt nozzle slightly different, but they know that the mag. I just, it's so frustrating that they haven't come out with it yet, because obviously they must have made prototypes. You'd think of it. Like why wouldn't they have? Or at least. It's on a pad somewhere and it's drawn, like, you know. I heard that TM have basically a, a room of stuff that they've made but never released. They do, yeah, it was, it was at that show, I can't remember, it was like a Japanese airsoft show, but they had like prototypes that were like musings, but they'd never bothered doing it. Like weird VSR, uh, in fact they did come out with one, like the weird folding stock VSR, I think that was one of their like early ideas, that was like spitboard, and then now they've actually produced it. Oh uh, yeah, the VSR one. And like weird, almost like hodgepodge, but that's like, like experimental stuff. Yeah, but amongst that, yeah, I can't believe that there's not, that firstly they've not made a 416. I know, and yeah. And it's so similar to like the M4s. And that they haven't made a scar because ultimately, <clears throat> like everything's in the same place. Yeah, I know. Like it's not like know. you know you're like you said making a bullpup or something like that. Yeah, and changing it's... a bolt, like making so many new parts because the bolt is the, would be the same piston or not doesn't ma doesn't affect a airsoft gas blowback riff. Yeah, I just I think they 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 do four and sixes recall. Yeah, exactly, and the fact that they do like scar recalls and stuff as well. I don't know. I, I'm I have a horrible feeling the next thing we see out of TM will be another like Type eighty nine variant, like a Type eighty nine CQB or something that again just like no one is like hyped for. Maybe you think there is another <laughs> version <laughs> like Type eighty nine. Like, yeah, I just I don't know. I don't know how much gets back to them. In order, in, I don't in think order. I don't think TM care about in the best possible way. Like, yeah, I don't think they're they're not bothered about the the market outside of Japan. Really, the, no. the Japanese market is what they're interested in. Yeah, that's what they cater for. That's why they did like the Type eighty nine and things like that. Because super cool. Yeah, it's really cool and the three round burst and things like that. And yeah. It's actually functionally, other than the nozzle being quite weak and mm. the short mags being terrible, yeah. um, it was functionally like really nice. Yeah. And although the fact that the front and the back end were held together by like two, two quite long, quite long two screws, but they it was like they looked like wood screws basically, are, and it just yeah. wasn't. And the fact that I couldn't get quite enough purchase on, like a little. Posy screwdriver, a little Phillips screwdriver, yeah. with like a tiny little head on it as well. It was just, it, just, it doesn't lend itself to me having confidence to like run it down a wall kind of thing. Probably not. Like, yeah. I just feel like it would, out of all my gas blowbacks, the Type 89 probably feels the most delicate. Yeah. And it's like the stock always develops wobble in it. <clears throat> Set on mine, so I've got the F, so I've got the folding stock version, whereas you've got the solid stock version. I don't, you may not get that as much. But. No wobble, because obviously it's just like this thing that's glued, like attached to it, but it's not super solid sounding. You've still got the problem between the front end and the receiver. Yeah. And this is what I had with like, when I first started airsoft when I was like 15, I got a M4A1, and it was always the, the, that little bit of wobble between the receiver and the front end. I was always like, not a fan of. Yeah, not a fan. What are we talking about? Rails? Hmm? Are we talking about rails? We did talk briefly about rails and putting uh, them on. We are about TM. Yeah, next stuff that we'd like to see from TM, I guess. Yeah. Um, Pick it up. Where we left off. Yeah, so I guess the next things that I would like to see. Some sort of, like a scar, ideally. Because for me, a 416 isn't that exciting. Because it's so close to, like, an M4. It and is. you can buy kits to do a 416. I've seen the How ones. 
yeah. and they're decent. I've seen an angry gun one as well. Have you? Actually, pretty decent. Like, well, certainly to look at. I mean, I've not. I don't know what the functionality is like on yeah. either. I would imagine the How one would probably be better because their stuff is pretty, pretty damn good. Ball. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, <clears throat> yeah, so a scar, because I wouldn't need to buy any mags. Yeah. And that's, <clears throat> in gas blowback world, that is a key factor. Such like any, any backwards compatibility that you can get with mags is welcomed. It's why I think Glock compatible things are so popular. Yeah. So, so popular. Do you want to grab that gym? Yeah. Uh, Grasshopper. Grasshopper. M yeah, GHM9 thing. This Lombarda thing. <clears throat> really cheap, like £200. Um, takes Glock mags. The Glock mag is also Magpul branded. Yeah. Which is something that you don't often see. Um, so it's literally got like P mag markings on it, which is pretty cool. And so the whole thing is, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty legit, to be perfectly honest. Um, this does technically work in other Glocks, but it is such a tight fit that I just wouldn't. Um, but when you get one of these, there's no stock, no, no. sights, uh, mm. nothing on the front end no. like, at all. It's just completely bare bones. But it, I guess it's designed for people more like you and me who would... They have, we have stuff for it. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. sights to put on it. I have a plethora of either suppressors or tracers. Or what's on here at the moment is actually um, one of the smoke units. So it's a flash unit and a smoke unit. So I got two of them. So I was going to do a comparison between nice. which one was actually better. But so, yeah, I think actually for the money, I was really impressed with this. And it didn't really bother me that the front end was a little bit wobbly. The whole thing's made of polymer. It, for, for 200 pounds, like... To get you in... To get you into gas blowback. TM hot, well, TM rubbers, TM barrels, like, it's everything you want. And Glock mags. So, and the amount of people that run, like, a TM or a WE Glock. Yeah. Where you can just use your mag straight away in this, like... They are a tight fit, I will say that. After watching CLW's video, someone else's video. Uh, Jaeger Precision. Jaeger Precision. Jaeger Precision has been putting out some absolutely banging yeah, videos recently. Super helpful. Yeah, yeah, really helpful stuff. Um, TM mags are tight. The Gen 5 isn't, because it has the same cutouts mm -hmm. yep. for their MOS. But they will work, you can get them in. And mm -hmm. over time, it's polymer lower, like it'll wear in. It will wear. Yeah. And that's the thing. Because there are various things that you can do, and I know that you can mod it to make it work a bit easier, but I kind of just like, for me, normally, if I get a new gun, I want to wear it in. Yeah. And I want to see what those initial patterns are wear. So I don't sort of get one, immediately open it up, start cleaning <laughs> it out. I will just start like wearing it. And I know that there's going to be grease in there that is too thick, because they always put sort of packing grease and stuff in into gas blowbacks, thinking, oh, it, you know, it's going to spend a year in a warehouse yeah. in the cold and stuff like that which is, it makes sense but actually when you get it I still would run I don't know a thousand or so rounds at yeah. least through the gun before I then took it apart <clears throat> cleaned it all down a bit saw where any wear patterns were and normally just taking it apart giving it a wipe down and like where things have rubbed together and it's built up kind of some sludge just get rid of that and again, just, I always just use silicon spray. Yeah. Just use the thinnest stuff possible. I don't know why you would ever, the amount of times that I've picked up a secondhand gun and inside the bolt area, it's just like this thick grease. And it's that bloody uh, like super grease that people use. It's great lube. I still haven't actually got some, but I've seen great things about it. But it's, it's too thick. I think people are not understanding the different viscosity for different purposes. I spoke to someone on the Discord years ago. But even, even like trigger boxes, people are like, oh, you can put some thicker stuff. Like the wear on these things takes so long. Yeah. Like we've had, now had our MWSs. It must be literally 10 years now. Is it 10 years since they came out? Yeah. 
2014. Like, it if like, not, f it was around about now. I think ten years ago. If not, it's on the door. It's and we we literally got batch one. Yeah. Like, batch one, shipment one. You know. Um, <laughs> straight from Hong Kong. Straight direct from Hong Kong. It's like okay. first ones. It, <laughs> yeah, first ones in the UK, basically. I was just so hyped for TM finally coming out with a full-size gas blowback rifle because I knew that the performance on it was going to be so much better than what I've been trying to squeeze out of that PTS Mega Arms and I just had nothing but frustration with. And the only reason I, the only reason I got the PTS Mega Arms was because everyone was going on about the LM4, but the LM4 had a three-piece upper. That's bizarre. Yeah. Which was just like, why would people want a three-piece upper receiver? In metal like, as well. I know, right? It was just seemed so dumb. And so as soon as PTS came out with one that was a one-piece upper, I was like, well, that's obviously going to be better. But PTS sprinkled their magical <clears throat> all over it. And it was just awful from like day one. I ended up sending it back to Land Warrior. They tried to fix it, just couldn't. And ended up sending me another rifle. And even then it was just problems, problems. Um, I've got it working now. <laughs> but it's like, I don't really want to use it too much i just <laughs> think best thing is just stay hands off with it and i kind of i kind of want to get it out relive old memories yeah it's in there i must say the gas mags hold gas incredibly well mm. they are like really really good yeah this is a throwback double check obviously like shooting something safe make sure there's nothing yeah in there the, the steel bolt as well like the recoil on it is re really nice is there no gas in it no oh unbelievable ultra uh yeah just whatever sort of Yeah, as like a as a object is lovely. It's just yeah. performance. It's the actual yeah, yeah, that's it. The actual like double feeding, not actually shooting, like stacking BBs up down the barrel was Yeah. <coughs> and like managing to shatter BBs and stuff like that. It was just there was a bunch of things about it that were just not good. Best thing about that at the moment is probably the optic on it. The Vortex <laughs> Crossfire. Which is yeah. great. Yeah. Still not heard back from EOTech either about no. my shot out um, green EXPS, which is annoying because right. I know they've received it in America. And I've shot them about three emails so far asking for an update and they seem to just be ignoring me now. They've got their site back, so they're like, not for you, not for you, peasant. You should not have your site back. Really annoying because that's what I need to go on the um, UMP basically mm. because it sits at that slightly higher ride height for the um, Reptilia mount or whatever it is, mm. GBRS. GBRS mount, yeah. Yeah. Oh. What for about? This was in, like a bloody student house for like a week. Oh no, that was Mark's. Mark left his. Yeah. And they fucked it. <laughs> They, well, I went the day after, and like they were just like fucking. I was just like, I don't leave anything. So why would you leave with a fucking student? Yeah, know. always leave things in a nice, safe condition yeah. where they can't be, where someone would have to know to like go and load it and do all these different things. Yeah. The only thing that I ever keep in the mags is gas, basically. Other than that, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, throwback. Pretty cool throwback though. It is cool. It is cool. That's the f this is the first rifle I ever saw you, you know, use, possess. Yeah, where was that? That was at, um... Porter's Head. Porter's Head, yeah. Black Ops Porter's Head. That was fun. Yeah, I was having a few problems with the rifle that day. But it did get some amazing, like, when that thing shot well, it did shoot 
well. <laughs> it did, you know, I did get some amazing shots off with that thing. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it was just so much more bother. And that's why I was so excited for the MWS when it came out. And I was just like, right, let's get on something which where they prioritise shooting the BB over everything else. Yeah. They're like, if we need to make the receiver a bit shorter or a bit taller or whatever, in order to make sure that this shoots better than everything else, then we'll do it. Mm. <clears throat> I think that's what, I don't know, I avoided VFC and GHK and stuff for a while. So I know certainly GHK were using AG buckings. For a long time. Which are a lot like thinner. And it was always the fact that TM would use a VSR like rubber or bucking that I always thought was better because that would handle the cold a lot better. Because mm. especially, you know, like continual fire. Like I was playing around with the KSG and after like 20 or so pumps on it, then you notice your like cheeks start to get cold. Like the whole, like that's the whole thing about a gas blowback system. It's going to get colder and colder mm. the more you use it. Yeah, VSR bucking, just much more compliant with repeated fire. Yeah, just continual. And that's it. I mean, if, I guess if you're an AEG user, I used to find it if you, you know, if you're playing on a cold day, you'd be shooting on full auto all the time anyway, but you'd start shooting and the BBs would like have to, they'd almost like pick up in front of you. If you weren't shooting like constantly, you'd wait like five minutes to trudging then go to shoot and you wouldn't be getting proper hop up until no. like the fifth or sixth bb and it's literally as it's like i guess warming up the hop up rubber yeah but in a gas blowback you're putting like gas that is even colder over that rubber mm. so you're cooling it down even more especially on like a cold morning or something so it's funny how you do notice like a gas rifle will perform differently in the morning to the afternoon like it's not always like perfectly linear mm. and you have to be able to account for that. I often do it with the weight of the BB, to be honest. Um, you can sort of mess with the hop, but I've always found that like kind of almost setting the hop and just being like, this is like set it almost like in the middle of the day, at like your ideal sort of temperature and then just kind of leave it and then just trust that the next time you go and play, you'll put a couple of mags in and be like, oh, that seems to be dropping a little bit short. Mm. Just trust it and just be like, no, within a couple of games, once these mags have warmed up against my chest or whatever, like this will be shooting how it's supposed to shoot. And it will, and it, it, and it, it gets to that. And then it'll get to like later in the afternoon, like everything's heated up properly and you'll be like, oh, this is like mm. absolutely on point. But you do have that, you know, little arc in the mornings that you just, everyone does it. And you'll be going and be like, oh, it's just, it's not quite shooting right. You'll think there's something wrong with the rifle, and it's just kind of—it's not even that; it's just physics. Yeah, <laughs> it's just that, like that's just how it kind of works. I mean, sometimes they're perfectly good first thing in the morning if you've had them like in the back of a warm car or something like that. You're mm. kind of all right, but for me, a lot of the time, it's you take stuff out, and it's like almost condensation on it. Yeah, kind of, and that's when you know that the rifle, like, is probably not going to be performing at like optimum standard, like right from the right from the get-go it will 100 percent affect the mags like i used to get like duffel bag full of my gas mags out of the car like six in the morning like they mm. are so cold it'll take at least a game for them to like warm up and sort of make do especially in the uk yeah that's it it's an issue <clears throat> like the temperature oh definitely yeah you just have to account for it well that's it and that's why again people have said <coughs> about using um like higher power gas and it, I, I've always said like well it's, there's almost like a fail safe system built into to most airsoft guns where it'll light strike yeah <clears throat> and if you put if it's a hot summer's day you put in really high power gas there's too much pressure in that mag that it will either kind of blow the pressure off or the hammer will hit the valve and there's too much pressure for it to knock the valve in mm. and it will just it will that's just it will be like yeah and it, that's a light strike and that ultimately means there's too much pressure in the mag for it to even work yeah and so that's kind of that's going to stop you from doing any like serious damage but if you've upgraded all the springs you put in a 200 percent hammer spring and things like that yeah. then yeah okay you might hit that and you might start doing some damage to like a plastic slided pistol yeah but for the most part you can use green gas in the summer 
as soon as you get to like 30 degrees and you're putting in green gas you you will start to be like mm, like you you'll kind of know yeah. like you'll feel that it's about to explode in your hand <laughs> and you might be like right, okay look, now let's switch down to like 144 gas or yeah. something like a bit more sensible yeah but the gun almost just kind of lets you know like when you should be adjusting your gas pressure and that's it on a cold day i've had plastic sided pistols and i put in black gas red gas and because it's two degrees mm. you know and i need something that's just gonna at least cycle that slide especially if you've got like a metal slide on a pistol or something like that then yeah. i mean the worst you're going to do is damage your nozzle I mean, yeah. unless it's a plastic sided pistol where you could crack your slide but you can always get replacements yeah um or what most people do is then if you had a plastic slided pistol it's no doubt a tm you'd normally upgrade get a metal slide Eventually, get a guard yeah. they're pretty good nowadays um if you're feeling bougie get a nova nova or yeah. detonator sort of in the middle you can get some gunsmith bros things like that yeah but ultimately you know like on the high capper market you've got like even Novridge is in on that like everyone's in on that market <clears throat> and with the new gen 5 block i think more people are going to get in on that i've seen detonator have come out with a slide yeah i saw that and i was sort of I saw that. I was half tempted to not follow my own advice and just leave it stop. <laughs> but because I'm looking at sort of weight saving a lot yeah. more than I've ever looked at it before, it means that I am actually looking at, okay, well, how much weight do I want to be carrying around? Mm. And, you know, that's why I've changed my belt set up. And that's what I've got now. Um, <clears throat> it's something I'm going to try and do a review on. But I've actually got the, uh, the bison belt. So this is made by Furry Concepts. So far, I really like it. And I found a new way of attaching um, my drop leg as well, which I did show you earlier. But essentially you've got a thigh, um, a thigh holster, but it's way further up. So I'm treating it. The UBL mid-ride that I used to use, which is on here, I've actually threaded it through uh, a different way because these wings would always dig in and whatever I did, even with it, this, like with the, the belt covering this part, I find it would, these wings would always be digging in and it would just never be comfortable. And actually with this setup here, this Safari Land setup, I just cut this uh, bit of thick nylon down. Uh, it's actually Velcroed onto the inside of this belt. And just with one loop means that it doesn't like pick up when you draw from it. Mm. This is really comfortable and it's so light as well. Yeah, um, I just need to get a double pistol for the front and probably swap this S Tech out. <clears throat> a trick I showed you earlier. Mm. So on here I've got a, a, a little Blue Force gear pouch and it has like a little bit, it's been put onto this belt in the usual way, but it has a tiny bit of of movement on there a tiny bit of play and hopefully you can sort of see that whereas this one it actually came with the new style uh, malice clips and what i did is i actually uh crossed them over behind and what it means is there is no movement in this pouch what like, as i move the pouch the belt moves now i didn't realize that you could do this i don't know if other people do it as well but you can sort of see from the bottom here that they're actually crossed over before they're put through that bottom bit of uh molly and yeah it means that this pouch has got like zero movement whatsoever so yeah handy little tip there and this even sitting down is really comfortable because it's got this kind of movement in it mm. like, yeah you had a quick go earlier didn't you yeah and it's just it moves with you versus trying to like push the belt up because it just has a bit of play, which normally is bad, but in that it works out. It just works, yeah, it just seems to work really well. And so yeah, part of my weight saving, new weight saving lifestyle, this uh, new bison belt is hopefully gonna come into, come into the mix as I attach a few more things on. I've got a T-Rex arms dump pouch, and as I said, I'll probably put a double pistol on the front here and just leave it at that and just leave it pretty yeah. kind of bare bones to be perfectly honest um 
And in here, I would literally just have some goggle wipe and probably some reloads for grenades, yeah. which I would put on. Another thing here, uh, a Hayden Strategic DC3RX, I think this one is. Um, so again, uh, where I'm breathing quite heavily, uh, sometimes a plate carrier can be a bit restrictive, so I got myself a, a chest ring, got myself a Haley one. Um, so with the dangler at the bottom, what's good about this is it covers my entire liver area. So for going out, I'm not going to get shot in the liver as much as people would be shooting tumours. So that's like, that's not a bad thing. I'd kind of all for that, but I, it would it would be really painful. I don't want to, <laughs> yeah. don't want to mess with it too much, but I got this so that I can run basically a little bit lighter setup uh, than I have been before. So I'm going to have to see how this works out, but also as part of this lighter lifestyle, do you want to grab uh, back, come back there? Yes. So this is why I was slightly frustrated about not having um, my EOTech back from EOTech in America, and I'm hoping to obviously get it back soon. So I got one of these, I got myself a new run cam, uh, which is, <clears throat> this one is for medium to close range, so it'll basically should capture hopefully some gameplay that I want to do soon. But I've got a normal EOTech that I put on the back of here, uh, an XPS, but it really needs an EXPS running at a lower one third so that you can see properly over the top of the scope cam. But this is the VFC uh, gas blowback UMP45. Now this thing is unbelievably light. It really weighs nothing and even the suppressor, uh, which is pretty cool because it has all the correct markings on it. Um, QD, like, secures on. Again, just doesn't weigh anything. The whole thing is just super, super light. Um, kind of similar to the G36, like WE. Yeah, it Sorry. is, but it's lighter. Oh, God, the yeah. whole thing just being polymer Smaller. and just weighing nothing. Yeah. Um, like a nice little folding stock as well. Not that I'd, I'd always kind of have the stock out. Yeah. But just to give you an idea, it's got a two round burst on it as well. So just semi, like, oh, it's so loud. But two round burst. How nice, a bit of full auto. Chugs. I, I love it, honestly, like this thing is, and the, the, fact, the fact that it is so light, the fact that it just doesn't weigh anything means that I think I'm going to have to be taking this out for a couple of games. I've got some extra mags for it as well, so I'm kind of all set for for that. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to taking this out. I remember the VFC UMPs back in the day, and they used to just... If you wanted to chop BBs in half, this was the most efficient way to do it. But then they came out with... The only version that worked was the Asia version, and all the ones that got sent to Europe were just like absolute trash. Yeah. Whereas now, I think they do pay a bit more attention to the European market, and yeah. it's that you know some of the stuff is all right now. So I'm looking forward to taking this out to a game and seeing how well it actually does because this uses a TM uh, barrel and yeah. and rubber. Now I, I believe it does anyway. Um, I'm not taking it apart. I want to take it out, shoot it stock, see how it kind of performs. Yeah. Um, give it a fair sort of whack before I start being like, okay, now I want to improve something. Because actually a lot of people ask me this, a lot of people say, they'll pick up like an MWS and they'll say, oh, what do I do first? What do I need to do? Mm. Just nothing. Shoot it. Just shoot it. Shoot it. Like even if there is something that you realize that you really want to have in that rifle that it's not doing, then you'll find it. By, by shooting it. By shooting yeah. it, you know, and, and that will kind of like highlight any flaws, you know. I don't know, you might find that you're so heavy on the trigger all the time that your bolt is always, I don't know, like almost freezing up and you might need like a lighter weight bolt set up or something like that. Yeah. Or, <clears throat> I don't know, you might find that you're only ever shooting on semi at over 50 meters, so you might mm. want to set your rifle up as a DMR, mm. for example. Um, but it is it's like dependent, it's sort of dependent on your local site as well. Yeah, that's the thing, you play CQB a lot, semi only. Yeah, Probably that's it. would benefit, lightweight bolt, snappy response, you know. But if you're doing, DM, you know, Woodlands, DMR, longer barrel, set your, set your rifle up for that. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it goes two ways. It's like if your if your heart is set on a build, sure, then you can like think, well, getting a new rail and doing X, Y, Z. But if most of the questions are like performance based, like how can you improve something you don't know? How, you know how it works at the moment. Mm. You don't know the status quo, so don't try and change it because you might end up making it worse. Yeah, yeah. That's and the, the thing way. is, that's it. The stock system is so good. And it's funny actually. My friend, um, <clears throat> my friend John said to me the other day. He said, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna build another upper for my MWS." Yeah. And I was like, "Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. We've all been there. We've all been like, I want to build another upper, and we've done. I've done it. Yeah. You've done it. Yeah. But ultimately, the best thing to do is just get another MWS because <laughs> the thing is, you'll build your second upper. Yeah. And you'll go through all the sort of rigmarole of of doing that, sourcing all the different parts, and then you'll be like, oh, I wouldn't mind like." like a lower with a folding stock or I wouldn't mind a, a, like an M16 style lower yeah. or a PDW lower or you know something you, you will find something else and you might as well just get another rifle I was having a look on fire support mm. um, an NWS carbine mm. so the one with the plastic furniture but it still has a carry handle which yeah. is super cool nice. um, plastic furniture guess how much Oh, I have no idea actually. Four twenty. Wow. Four hundred and twenty pounds. Thing... Whereas if you get, they do a, a Mark eighteen version mm. and it's over six hundred. Yeah. The internal system yeah. is identical. They will out of the box. They will shoot exactly the same. Mm. But there's like a two hundred pound price difference. Like as if you if you're like I want to do this build. I've got this rail. I'm going to build this upper, or whatever. You might as well get this carbine yeah. rifle for 420 by the rail you want yeah and you're you're then at the because i think an nws is about 50 pounds more expensive mm. and same as cqbr but you get like a metal rail system and stuff yeah. like that so you get a few extra things but if you know you're going to mod it just get the carbine like it's the same thing yeah why not yeah and going back to like building a new upper whilst the initial cost might seem like a lot more it's like oh 150 quid or however much you might get a second hand one however much you paid for that upper unless you've literally got it for dirt cheap mm. 400 pounds does seem like a lot over that but then you think about filling that upper if it's bare bones if or, it is yeah yeah for what assist hop out of barrel and then you have to buy a rail for it and mm -hmm. it's like you're probably not doing that for less than 200 pounds and so are you getting a charging handle with it yeah the bolt you know the, even the screw that holds the hop-up yeah. system in uh, little things source. like that that you're just like oh my goodness like where do i source this tiny little part if you don't have it yeah albeit it is a lot easier now back when no aftermarket parts were around and we were just going off of like surplus stock oem stuff it was a lot harder but still it's mm -hmm. still expensive to populate an entire upper from, from scratch oh yeah and even more so with the lower yeah because straight away, all the like aftermarket trigger boxes are like minimum £150 yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. All the way up to the BJ Tacticals, which some of those are like £300. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Which, I, I know. Like, just absolutely... It's, it's different if you're chasing performance and you're like, I, like our F1 builds. Like, you know you're trying to make something a little bit more special. But if it's just like, yeah, I wouldn't mind saving a bit here or there. You're just doing it just to have a second something, lower, end of the rest, whatever. Mm. Yeah, just be a bit more conscious, I think, and just understanding that the rabbit hole will actually be quite an expensive one. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a lot easier just to start off with that base rifle. Yeah. And just kind of then add bits on as you get them or yeah. as you need them and take the sort of, <clears throat> you know, upgrading to a steel barrel. And just doing that one swap. Uh, yeah. Uh, do one thing at a time. Yeah. Like it, these builds do not happen overnight. No. I certainly don't go out and buy all of the parts in one go. I would normally no, each paycheck yeah. that comes in, I might treat myself one month to like a barrel, which is going to cost me like eighty pounds plus twenty quid shipping or something. Mm. So that's like a month's worth of sort of extra airsoft expenditure, and I would get that, fit it, and then be like, right, okay, now what's the next? Like, yeah. What's the next things? So for me at the moment, because I'm, again, looking at weight savings and things like this, I'm in the process, will hopefully be something coming on the channel soon, of doing a PDW MWS build. Mm -hmm. I have a seven inch aero precision uh, rail coming, which, uh, from America, which is so cool. I, I, I can't wait. And I've got like a green charging handle for it and stuff like that. So we're going with a sort of like 
black and green mm. theme. I've got some sort of tan theme. It's got black, black sort got of. Black, got black <laughs> as covered, like got all that done, but green, I don't know. It's just Especially, unique, it's just a bit different. I'll yeah. tell you what, do you want to grab my only OD green gun out of there? Because people will probably get a kick of what I, I whacked on top of it. Just to make it like as ultimately ridiculous as possible. <laughs> getting um, getting in some sort of battle rifle calibers. As I get weaker, I buy, buy bigger guns. Although I've had this for maybe like year and a half or something like that, but only recently picked up some extra mags for it. And so I'm gonna do a bit more mucking around. <laughs> so yeah. uh, we have a, tri a Trigicon AccuPower, uh, two and a half to 10 by 56 on a uh, WE <laughs> G3A3. Uh, it is unbelievably cool. And it's on a Vortex three inch offset mount, which actually, so loud, actually gives you really good eye relief. And as an optic, I know this looks so stupid on this rifle, <laughs> but I put it on just to sort of test, I was gonna put it on my Shaytac and I kind of love it. <laughs> I don't know why. It gives a very PSG. Sorry, the angle's changing slightly because the cameras are overheating. Um, but luckily I've got two cameras now, so I'm <coughs> able to sort of work around it a little bit. Oh my goodness. This coffee is delicious. I've got it on this heat pad as well. Yeah. So it's like full bottom of that. Oh, well. Wow. Yeah, it's really good in these sort of disposable cups because mm. I can get my own black coffee, put it into one of these, and put it on the little heat pad, and it stays hot. Nice. So for when I'm doing like, editing and things like that. Handy. It's funny. Someone left me a comment and said I should stop making airsoft videos um, and just sort of focus on like the the cancer stuff because that's what like, most people are here to hear about. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually respond, but I kind of just wanted to say like, this is what I, I love doing, I love talking about. Yeah, granted, I'm not, I don't love editing videos or anything like that, but that's why most of my stuff is kind of either long form or like very simply edited. Mm. But I, d I actually get a lot of pleasure out of getting information out into the community and and just talking about airsoft stuff, mm. like just talking about it in general, just talking about anything airsoft is, that's like my kind of deal. Like that's kind of what I'm into. So yeah. for me, it's not like I'm, like talking about cancer is hard. Like I don't want to know anything about cancer. Like I didn't want that to be any part of my life. I wanted it to always just be kept on the peripheries and never to, never to touch, you know, me, my friends or my family. And so, <clears throat> yeah, didn't really want that journey to happen. Whereas the airsoft journey is one that I very much wanted. So exactly. that's the one that I'm happy to kind of continue making videos about. And I'm kind of less keen on making videos about sort of, about such doomish subjects as, as bloody cancer. It's not the purpose of the channel, if I may speak on this. You know, it's... It's not. It's never what the channel was supposed to be about. And it's lovely that... What was really unbelievable was the amount of support that came out, not only from the community, mm. but from, like, YouTube in general, which is something that I never expected. Mm. Um, and it's given me strength. It really has. And it's made me... It's got me up on those days that have, where I've been exhausted. Because at the moment I'm doing uh, chemo on like a three week cycle. And so like for a week and a half after chemo, I'm sort of low energy, like really struggling. And then for the next week and a half up to the next chemo, I tend to be doing a lot better. I eat a lot better. I've sort of, you know, I start to kind of like get my strength back and things like that. And then you kind of hit in <clears throat> to the next round of chemo. And as you know, I'm doing like fasting around that as well. Mm. So at the moment I get kind of the fasting weekend the weekend of feeling terrible then the weekend of kind of feeling all right and i'm hoping that that kind of continues that and it that doesn't then turn into like multi weekends of not feeling very good 
But you know what, on those, yeah, like I said, on those days that I am struggling a bit, like reading through the comments and like the support that people have given me, mm. it's just, yeah, like, like completely blown me away. Um, I know that uh, obviously Mike from Pew Hub, yeah. he did a, a charity game, only Airsoft did a, a charity game, which I was really sad that I couldn't attend, but it was just before one of my chemo sessions. And so and it was the other side of the country as well, as much as I would have loved to have attended. Uh, sadly, I couldn't, and so uh, apologies to to those guys over at Only Airsoft. And but thank you very much for for doing the game and anything in in my honour that's done in the name of Airsoft is <laughs> thank you. Um, like I don't know what else to say to be honest. Um, it's just really you know it's just quite humbling really, yeah. and. <clears throat> So yeah, I'm gonna continue making videos about airsoft stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's gonna that's gonna continue and it's Ollie Talks Airsoft. It is Ollie and it's it's not gonna change to <laughs> yeah, Ollie talks about his sort of cancer journey. Yeah. That's it. I've made a separate playlist for for cancer stuff yeah. uh, that people can kind of go on if, if they're interested in that. And I've actually got some more interesting bits to, to kind of do on that and say about what I've been doing mm. with like treatment. But I'd rather try and as much as possible just kinda of keep those those things separate. Yeah. Kind of have one that <laughs> not depressing, but informative. Informative, and then the other one that is just like me enjoying myself, yeah. doing airsoft stuff, and, yeah. and having fun with that. Speaking about enjoying ourselves, oh man, um, let's grab this as well. We were playing around with this earlier, <laughs> setting it up, ex like trying to get the grip exactly where it is for um, in the John Wick film. And using an XPS, I think it is an XPS that you use it rather than EXPS. Yeah, it doesn't um, look so high. It looks a bit lower, so this is like the exact. And using an RVG as well, um, and this is a real Magpul RVG, real EOTech. And the actual gun is a Tokyo Marie uh, Keltec KSG. So cool. Um, <laughs> has a little gas tank in the back here, and then it takes uh, shells in the bottom. So it's got a little feeding tube where it takes two shells and then one that actually loads um, that just takes the one shell. And it's got three barrels uh, at the top and a mock couple of tubes, but... So cool. So nice. Because the thing is, I've got the H70. I've got the Tokyo Marie M870. And that one was cool because, well, I mean, the gas tanks expanded, which was annoying. Yeah. But the fact that it had three round and six round yeah. meant that you could, instead of getting 10 shots from each shell, you get five shots from each shell, but double load each barrel. So the th each three each barrel would have two shots in. Whereas this one is always just three shots. So you get 10 shots, 30, 30 BBs in a shell. Let's, let's get one out. Uh, oh, that's such a pain to get out. Yeah, let's sort of keep it down. I know. It's much easier when you're actually holding it properly. It takes these shells, look quite realistic, but they're not the right like size or anything. Don't think so. But 30 BBs, three barrels, so 10 shots, kind of loads in the back. Uh, you've got little switches and stuff, but they don't, they, they don't do anything. They're kind of trinkety. Very plasticky, but you know what? Really cool. Also this one, you can't slam fire. So if I hold the trigger down, that's the reset. Whereas the M870, not only could you put it on a six shot, mm. you could also slam fire it. But I think actually, if, if I could choose again, I would probably go for the Breacher. Because the Breacher has a better gas tank, yeah. but it also has the same features. And it's kind of got, I think it's probably got the same length in a barrel, I would have thought. Because ultimately yeah, the, the inner barrel length is not that long. That's one of the things that TM do. You know, like on the MWS, you've got a full length 14.5 14 14 outer, but the inner is still 250. 250 mil. Yeah. Um, I guess we're talking imperial and metric, but yeah, you know, but... that's kind of like how the measurements go. Um, yeah, super cool. Uh, yeah, love the EOTech on here and the John Wick. <laughs> Relive your favourite John Wick moments. Like, why not jump up on top of that? So cool, <laughs> so cool. Ah, oh, but yeah, I can feel it getting cold, yeah. like on here where the gas is coming through the system. Um, 
What a, yeah, yeah, what a cool piece. What a cool piece. Sounds great. It does. Does not sound as good as the best sounding gun in Airsoft, in my opinion. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I do. If you want to talk about it. Should we, do you want to... Oh. Do us a favour. <laughs> What are we talking about? <laughs> talking about the M14. Oh shoot. Oh, it is here. No mag. Don't need any mags for it, because you can't dry fire it, you know what I mean? No. Well, you can if you fuck the mag up. Yeah, that's true. I'm not. I'm just not really going to mess with this too much, nope. because I'm hoping to take it to the range yes. soon <laughs> and do some shooting with it. But we've got a real wood stock. Um, this was an RA Tech level two yeah. that I got straight from the manufacturer, basically. And then the trigger was so bad that I had to go out and buy the RA Tech uh, trigger for it. It's just known WE stop trigger. Awful. It sucks. I put it on my trigger pull gauge. It like doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It like hits. It hits the limiter on it. It's, it's <laughs> like so much that. I literally need to use one of those baggage things yeah. and be like, start measuring it in kilos of weight. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. But once you've got this new trigger in here, yeah, it is like, it's Chris. really, but oh, this thing just, best sounding airsoft gun ever. Just absolutely love this thing. And even firing it sounds great as well. Oh, God, yeah. Like, it's the top cover, it's the bolt, charging handle, everything. It's the rotating. Oh, just everything about it is just. And these have been out like over a decade. Yeah, I might be wrong in saying it. I think it's WE's first gas gun. And they're still just. Do you reckon? I think it, I think it is. I genuinely think it is. Could it really be? Obviously, pistols and stuff I think came out. They were TM clones, but I, I believe this is. This is just. I, I mean, it's hard to kind of overstate or understate like how good looking this thing really is. We've got some markings on the top cover there, which look just. Just unreal, and like the grain on here is just <sighs> sometimes companies just get it right, and this is one of those rifles that ever since I first saw it, I was like, I need to get my hands on one of these. But I've always known that I've always wanted just. Like an absolute classic rifle, no optics, wooden stock, RO Tech trigger box, ultimately. I was hoping that I'd be able to get away with the WE one for a little while. But <laughs> literally. It, literally, as soon as it came, it was like, this is like, I'd be like hanging my weight off it to get the trigger to, to get the hammer to drop. So, yeah, pretty quickly had to go out and spend the money getting the RA Tech box, but so worth it. Like, genuinely, if you're going to buy any upgrade for one of these, I guess. That's what everyone says on the forums as well. They say, look, just get the trigger box. You will need one eventually. At minimum, <clears throat> trigger box housing. Because that's the issue. Yeah, that's the bit that starts to develop play. And then it's... And the fact that the entire, like, trigger assembly had play yeah. when mine first came, you'd pull back on it and the whole assembly would move. <sighs> Not ideal. Um, anyway, such a, a, a cool... Giant battle rifle. <laughs> um, I just think it's, I just think they're so much fun. And something else I thought we could talk about was um, real steel, because mm. uh, we talked a bit about putting like real steel parts on on airsoft guns, which yeah. is definitely possible. Oh but obviously, no pressure bearing parts, nothing that's illegal. Literally, we're talking like no. grips, stocks, handguards, buffer tubes. Optics. Optics, yeah. All that kind of stuff. Furniture like, in general. Furniture in general, yeah. Nothing um, but. You can just get selectors and things like that, but no pressure bearing parts. That's the, they're the illegal and restricted. Check your local parts. laws. Check your local laws, basically. Yeah. Um, but 
as far as because obviously you've got people like you know Travis Haley who has been into airsoft for over 10 years now and it seems that you know maybe four or five years ago mm. with like Liku on T-Rex arms and Garan Thumb like airsoft has got a bit more acknowledgement from the real steel community mm. as being like a bit legit but there is still this and I guess I see this from like T-Rex arms and people like that where it's like the value of airsoft is not in the running around shooting it's in the movement the communication mm. like going to these big like milsim events and and learning how to communicate as part of a team yeah and doing all that and and i was thinking that is true but most people i mean he's got access to a range where he can shoot like around cars and he's it's very got, dynamically you know, yeah super a really dynamic range that he gets to play on and i guess most people don't have that no and and actually, what I wanted to say is that I think what the whole of, not the whole of, but like a lot of the shooting community is missing out on um, is the weekend skirmish. And it is the guaranteed force on force, you know, two or three games in the morning, each lasting 45 minutes, two or three games in the afternoon, doing the same. Mm. Guaranteed force on force action in set, vicinities and zones you know in set like arenas or aos then it just it builds like those like snap reflexes that being able to like get up on the gun quickly i was saying to you like if i haven't played airsoft for a while i'll go and play some cqb and if someone turns and points a gun at me then my first reaction isn't to pick my gun up and swing around and point to them. It's to go, <laughs> yeah. and I think like, unless you're like trained in the in the army or have some sort of formal training, that's going to be your first response as well. Yeah. As soon as someone points a gun at you, your first response isn't to point the gun back and start pulling the trigger. Yeah. You kind of just go, oh, I'm banged to rights. And you kind of almost put your hands up. and Torch in the face, barrel pointed at you. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it puckers you up, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I think actually, whereas on like a Milsim event, you might get like two or three engagements over 24, 48 hours. Yeah. The fact that you're getting these forced engagements all the time means that you're constantly like having to get up on the optic. And it's like, instead of like holding, say you're trying to hold a room or hold a barricade or something like that, in a Milsim event, you might be doing that as your team move up, so you're there for a couple of minutes. In a 45-minute game, you might be trying to hold that for 40 minutes. Yeah. Like, how good are you at holding the weight of your rifle? Or, you know, like, how, how well can you actually handle all these situations? And, like, moving around dynamically and quickly for these sort of short periods of time, getting up on the gun and engaging targets, like, above, below, squatting down. Like, I think there's a lot to be said. I think basically the real steel community is still missing out because they're still only sort of looking at Milsim as being the legitimate kind of airsoft. Whereas they're sort of almost turning their nose up at the weekend skirmisher, which is what I was going back to Travis Haley. He was like, he plays with his kids. Yeah. He's a weekend skirmisher. Yeah. And everyone looks up to him. You know, everyone looks up, you know, 22422. Like, you know, this. Yeah, you know, you know, Travis Haley is sort of, as far as sort of like fundamentals and stuff go, he's like one of the one of the daddies of like modern shooting, and if it's good enough for him, I think that's a message that's kind of almost got lost mm. as sort of newer shooters have come to the fore. You know, like yeah, like Lucas from T Rex, who is a, like undoubtedly like a fantastic shooter, like hands down, and like Garan Thumb and stuff like that, but. You know, I know that they, they would choose on a weekend not to go to an airsoft skirmish. They'd probably choose to go to a live range, test lots of like cool new guns, new yeah. gear and stuff like that. But I have never tested gear so hard as going to a skirmish. Yeah. And, you know, like crawling through brambles, like trying to squeeze through something that I'm just a little bit too big to squeeze through. Mm. And like tearing gear, like ripping um, stitching. It puts your gear to the test. Yeah. And it means that, you know, things like with that belt that I've got, like realising that actually I really like the UBL mid-ride and the Safari Lands, but however I run that configuration, it always digs into my hips. Yeah. And it always I always get that. And so switching to a different configuration 
and learning and practicing, meaning that I can run this system comfortably for a long period of time, like that's something that you can discover in a single day and you don't need to like plan for a mill sim no. where you've got to be like, right, okay, we've got to do three days of planning just to make sure we've got everything, you know, packed away, you know, whatever, spare batteries, gas, be iPro, spare iPro, everything. Like if you're planning for a weekend skirmish, especially if you're running a gas rifle, one of the joys of it is no charging batteries or anything like that. You chuck everything in a bag and you go. Yeah. Like that's it. You know, and especially if you've got a site nearby that is just takes walk-ons, then that's it. You know, you can get up in the morning, you know, you get up at seven in the morning, you're like, right, I'm gonna go play airsoft today. Um, and you can go in and you can like hone in your gear, realize actually when you're wearing whatever face protection you're wearing, you're looking down and you actually can't see your gear or something like that. Mm. And maybe that's the face protect, you know, that's the eye protection that you normally wear on the range and stuff, but you never normally look down. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. Um, there's so many like tiny little things that you can hone just by going to a weekend skirmish. And and it, not only that, but like the skills as well. Like the fact that it's, if you go to a local CQB site, it can be constant door kicking yeah. and room clearing. And rather than one or two engagements over over a day or whatever, it's cool because you get to use your nods or whatever, you know, but actually just having that that constant, like, you know, getting your adrenaline going, mm. knowing that you're going to have an engagement within the next 20 minutes and being able to force that as well and being able to sort of, you know, learning how to control those engagements and mm. on like a much smaller scale. I just find it like unbelievably satisfying. And I just think, <clears throat> yeah, I think a lot of real shooters are missing a trick there. I think they're really missing out on something that could be another tool in the arsenal just because it's sort of, you know, they'll look, at, they'll see speed softers. Like if a speed softer runs in and shoots you, you got shot, mate. Yeah. Like, you know, you've got to be prepared for. It's because you know, if you if you want to play like that, you've got to hold your corners, hold your quadrants. You know, you've got to. If you want to go out, roll out with your with your boys, like with your team or whoever, then you want to be squared away. You you be squared away, but you'd be ready for that speed softer running in. And if he runs in and shoots three of you by the time you've shot him, that's not on him. That's on you. You know, mm. that's honing your skills. That's being on it. You know. And that can happen. That can happen in a weekend. You know? yeah. That can happen on just a Sunday skirmish or a Saturday. Or the amount of places that will do like an evening. Like a lot of CQB sites will do like an evening because they can have like indoor lighting and stuff like that. Yeah. Especially like over in Hong Kong or something like that. Like that's a big part of it where you can you'll be indoors. You've got your own lighting, so it doesn't matter what time of day or night you're playing. Mm -hmm. Sort of, you just turn up and go. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've been rambling on for ages. No. <laughs> I think people, I think real stuff, again, I, this is uh, possibly speaking out of tone, I don't shoot real guns, but... No, not do I. Like that, so. From our perspective, I think real still shooters, predominantly in the US, ultimately, mm -hmm. that's where they have the most freedom with this sort of thing, are probably missing a trick if they're looking at airsoft and not seeing it as, like, an open sandbox for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ultimately, yeah. you know, like, I don't know how many people get fully geared up, for whatever reason, whatever mm. that end purpose is for having body armor, rifles, whatever, like what self defense, whatever. I don't know how many will go to a flat range and take their play carry with them, mm. wear their helmet, wear their nods. A bit ridiculous. And I can only imagine that's probably the only thing that, or the only place that a lot of people can access to shoot their shoot their weapons, shoot their rifles, yeah, yeah. shoot their pistols. Airsoft, you can do that. You need yeah. the gear. You know, you need the gear because the whole point is that skirmish level where you need to reload. You need your sidearm, you need your other you know, accessories, whatever you have with you, because that is indicative of the skirmish. You're going mm. out and the whole point is force on force, aiming at people, shooting at others, defending yeah. you know, scenario situations. Um, it's like the intangibles, like you were saying earlier, you know, like the muscle memory, picking up on your rifle, like obtaining a sight picture, which isn't just paper target, like... Mm -hmm. is that sort of thing which I guess other YouTubers and other people who have you know played airsoft they understand that there's an asset but for your average shooter your average real steel shooter I think there is a lot of benefit mm. other than just you know yeah getting more used to it dry fire is a big thing as obviously as well you know even um, what was I going to say even testing like rifle builds or like weapon loadouts, you mm. know, the difference between a 14.5 versus a 10.5 actually 
I've got, you know, I've got a PSA 14.5. I think it's usable for everything. You might use an airsoft version of a 14.5 in CQB and be like, damn, I'm snagging on everything. You yeah, could probably yeah, think yeah. about a pistol build if you're in America again. Yeah. You yeah, know, that's and true. ultimately, that was a lot cheaper to do. Oh, well, you can do your dream build as well. Yeah. Because you know, there's so many, like, restrictions, I guess, in America with the ATF and stuff. Yeah. But actually, yeah, if you want to build <clears throat> whatever you want, yeah. fantasy build, you can do it in airsoft and go out and run it. For a bit of fun, no, you know, tax load, t- tax stamp, SBR. You want a suppressor. You you want to imagine how an end build would. Generally, be, like making a dream rifle in airsoft to see how you would, you know, use it, move around with it, is going to be a lot cheaper yeah. than I think. And yeah. you probably get it a lot sooner. To be fair, yeah, um, that's very true. And actually, you can it's you can actually buy. Say you were going to build a certain like a PSA rifle, but you were like, oh, I'm going to put on a a guys at URGI rail and stuff yeah. um, then you could actually just go and buy that rail and you could actually put it onto your airsoft gun and see how you feel with it yeah. and see how you get on with it Yeah. Um, and then when you actually get the real the real firearm you can then just swap the part back, back yeah. onto the real thing and be like oh well there we go you've got used to that now Yeah. And then just go and buy a, a replica one to put on your airsoft gun and keep on going out and playing mm-hmm. and honing your skills with it and like you said snag hazards Yeah. Like, do you need that extra rail room for lasers, flashlights, scripts. The, the amount of time that it took me to set up exactly where I wanted my foregrip, mm-hmm. it took me games to do. Mm-hmm. And you know, you would find that, yeah, it just wasn't quite right. And eventually, I ended up moving the rail section and then moving the grip back on the rail section just to get it mm-hmm. exactly how I wanted, and so that everything felt just right for me. And someone else would pick it up and be like, "Oh, you should really move this grip." I'm like, mm, for you, yeah, yeah. But not for me, and that's the like that's the the beauty of doing a build, isn't it? You know, yeah, you, figuring all this stuff out. You end up building the exact thing that you need for whatever purpose you're building this thing for, and ultimately, airsoft as a sandbox is just going to be cheaper. Even in round count ammo, you know, like I guess ammo recently has been very expensive from things I've watched. Yeah, BBs real cheap. AG even cheaper. You don't need gas. Yeah, yeah, that's it. AG is that anyone that's thinking of getting into airsoft. AG is you sh- yeah, that's where it. you start. Like that is one hundred percent. That is the place to start. Yeah. Budget obviously is ultimately the limiting factor for a lot of things. But if you start off with an AG, even if it's not the exact rail system you have on your actual rifle, your real steel rifle, or it's not the exact stock, you can do budget friendly things to replicate. Mm-hmm. You know, your rifle to then, I guess, be benefiting from practice in skirmishes with your setup. Mm. it's like length of port which is like well it's not the exact BCM stock I have on my PSA or whatever but you, it, you can make do if budget is like a limitation for you um, it doesn't need to be perfect when you start wanting the finer things within airsoft and stuff sure you can build the perfect one to one I know someone who's done that with an 11982s you know like airsoft how version real steel um, Demaco version like super legit but you don't need to do that. It doesn't need to be as high brow, as nice as it yeah. is. Yeah. And the thing is, that's it. I think what's nice is to to have maybe one thing where you're like, this is the build yeah. that I sort of went a bit all out on. Yeah. And that's it. That's where like maybe buying a real steel rail and fitting it onto an airsoft gun. It seems ridiculous, but in the UK where we don't really get to do that kind of thing, no. it's fun. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where you're just like, it just brings another element yeah. Uh, to it, and I I just love it. I love doing I love doing a build. Yeah. It's the excitement of like how is it going to end up? You know how is it going to how is it going to turn out? Yeah. Um, the expectation of what it's going to be, and hopefully matching it. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Getting to <laughs> getting to the point that you're happy with it. I'm really looking forward to doing this PBW build and bringing it yeah. uh, bringing it to the channel. But um, but yeah, that's mostly actually what I wanted to talk about. It was just to talk about um, what you thought about the real steel. And, and ultimately, I agree with what you say, actually. Mm. Uh, I think there is, they, they are missing a bit of a trick with, with the sandbox environment, especially of a weekend skirmish. Yeah. Because ultimately, you, you'll have your goal, but if you want to like walk off and be like plinking at a tree, yeah. like, no one's really going to stop you. No. You're just going to be like, yeah, fair enough, go ahead, do what you want. You're like, if it's gear, you want to test where your pouches are best placed on your belt mm. or on your rig. You can do that without having to like feel a bit awkward or actually just testing it in, a, in an environment where it's conducive to test it 
oh, I yeah, actually yeah, need yeah. to reach for this. Not just like taking my time, seeing if it's comfortable, but like, oh no, someone's shooting at me. I need to reload. Mm. It's like the pressure environment as well as being put in this, into a situation where it's actually necessary to do so, things as such. Mm. And that's it. It's like, get some, get some mud on your gear. Yeah. I mean, the amount of times that we've been to like a woodland site and it's recently rained and like you're going along, you've got your gun and you know that the enemy team are somewhere in front of you, but you're not focused on that at all because you're slipping around in the mud. Yeah. And you realise that actually, you know, your situation awareness is terrible because yeah. You're slipping around in all this mud and you're like, damn, I really shouldn't have worn trainers That's the thing. to do this. Yeah. And it's like all of these little things that like, that you may not think about. Or like taking water with you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is the one thing everyone fails on. Yeah, I always right. make sure I have a camel back, always have some water. But I've been on even a 45-minute game and we've trudged to the top of a hill. We've got there. And like half the team is basically combat ineffective because they're all there like completely sort of like bent dead. double, like dying. I'm there like giving everyone a, like, a swig of water from my camelback and I was like, oh God, you know, within 30 seconds, people are kind of back on their feet again. But like hydration, like yeah. having that throughout, even on short skirmishes, like having that there and available, mm. super important. Like, um, like unbelievably so. Yeah. I, I can only go off of, on a similar vein, I can only go off of like my personal experience and it's like, Clothing, huge one. It's like going into airsoft and thinking, oh, you know, I need going to like military surplus stores, uh, MTP everything, yeah, like, yeah, 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 getting like boots, you know, stuff like that, and they're like playing CQB and then realizing military boots are actually really quite loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, I don't have an end purpose in terms of like training for something with shooting. Hopefully not, but like for someone who is like police officer or whatever again someone training for self-defense you'd be like maybe i don't wear steel boots you know yeah maybe, maybe actually wear... a pair of vans is yeah fun. you know like it's it's thinking about things in that way and like and um, using it in a context where you probably use it properly mm. and knowing what works and what doesn't again this is what i, I swear i would we'll go back it was, it was travis haley that was saying it um mm. and he was saying most airsofters know their gear Mm. so much better than real steel shooters just because simply the fact they're using it all the time yeah and it's not just hung up yeah. it's taken out at the weekend and it's put through its paces and actually sometimes like literally a pouch will move one section of molly over and you'd be like what's the point of that and it's like well actually where i sling my rifle yeah like i've had it before where you know i've wanted to grab the, you know grab the mag, bring the rifle up to change it, and every single time the sling is in the way. Mm. So I've moved it over, and now whenever I go, because that's my natural movement. Because mm. sometimes you just gotta go with what you naturally do. Some people say, oh no, you've gotta pick the rifle up first, then do, well, maybe that's maybe that's a way to do it, but it's not the most natural way for you to do it. And normally the most natural way for you to do it is gonna be the fastest. Yeah. Um, you can learn new ways, new techniques, and test them out, and if it's, more comfortable for you to do it you will just naturally do that but you have to kind of play into what your body naturally does with the kind of gun mm. so that's what i mean so sometimes yeah it will be literally moving something over or something down or as i said not being able to look down and see something and so you know i've had it before where i used to run things in the admin panel mm. on the top of my jpc then realized as soon as i put stuff in there i was having a bit of trouble getting the mags out yeah so I stopped like running paper and stuff in there started running it further down in a dangler um and that was from practically you know literally being in a firefight and going i can't get the mag out mm. and being sort of bent forward and struggling with it and it was all fine when i was stood up and like playing at home that was great you know oh not nice <laughs> and slick all good as soon as you're in that different situation it doesn't work anymore yeah and and that's i think what travis Haley meant when he was talking about like people understand their gear a lot better yeah and and that's it and, and the missing of the trick that actually this doesn't have to happen over a Milson game and I would agree with what T-Rex says about or Lucas says about you know communication movement yeah you know and all that kind of stuff that is very much like a Milsim mm -hmm. thing um, but it still comes into play on a skirmish it does but, yeah. but the skirmish brings into play the firefights you know the force on force the how do you respond when you turn your head and someone's literally pointing a gun at you? Yeah. Like, do you quickly manage to duck into cover? Do you bring your gun up or do you freeze? Because mm -hmm. actually, 
until you've been in that situation, you don't know how you're going to react. And you might be the sort of person that freezes. And that might be a training need. That you even go to mill sims, you may not experience that. But on a skirmish, because you're going to have 20, 30, 40 engagements or whatever throughout the day, like your, your chance of experiencing all these different things is going up and up and up. Yeah. You know, and flanking another team, like getting in behind them, like shooting everyone in the yeah. back, like the satisfaction of some of those moments. And you've just got to play in order to get those moments. And you've you just got to just get out and just have fun. And it's not even about that. It's when someone else manages to flank and shoot you, you and your team in the back and you are like, fair play. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fair play to you. Unless you have firearms like within your occupation and you, you're using it, you're never going to be in that situation. So for your average person who might shoot real steel, hopefully will never have to use their <laughs> their firearms shooting people. Yeah, it puts you in a situation where you wouldn't otherwise be in. Mm. Um, and for whatever reason, you might want to train things like, sure, like that. You, you're doing it without having to lethally hurt <laughs> someone. I know people, there's like simulation stuff, like sim simulation rounds. Simulation, I think it's quite expensive. Quite, that's the thing. It's quite limiting, as well as you don't have such a saturation of different people. You don't have kids that are all gun ho that will run in to represent yeah. that type of person, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or break or warrant that type of situation. You have generally quite tactical scenarios mm -hmm. that are laid out by probably trainers. And again, that's not undermining the the experience you gain from something like that, but it's a very set level of tactical training. Yeah, it's it's almost assuming some tactics from both sides. Yeah. Because actually, I guess in the real world, like some sides will, you will get some people that will just be like, well, we're just going to run in. Yeah, anything like, can we're happen. We're just going to do this. Anything. Like, as much as you can train for something, and as much as you can try and articulate it, like officially, like, what was I going to say? Like, Academize it if that's the right term. Like nothing in the real world really happens as it does on paper. Well, they always say truth is stranger than fiction, don't they? Yeah. And so, like the idea of you know a speed softer running into a room and suddenly shooting three or four people. Yeah. That's not, unfortunately, that's not an unrealistic thing no. to you know cross over potentially yeah. into the real world. As tragic as it is, but if you're preparing, if you're prepping for stuff. Well, you've got to prepare for all of it, haven't yeah. you? You know, otherwise you're kind of only doing a half. You can't just assume that actually, oh, well, if there's going to be an engagement, yeah, it's going to be at X ray. You know, I guess you know there are stats out there that people have have said about. You know, oh, yeah. most engagements take place at X ranges and and things like that, and it's more likely to engage over a hundred yards or something. Yeah, but that's you know we're we're always talking averages here. That's and the thing. There's you don't. You might, sad to say, you might not be that average. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you that's know? it. You hope that you're going to be, <clears throat> yeah, I guess the average that actually don't ever encounter no. any, any kind of violence throughout their lives. And no. touch wood that everyone out there is never going to experience anything like that because it's, it's not cool. No. Um, life is far too precious. Yeah. But, but yeah, it is fun to put yourself in those adrenaline inducing mm. situations. Mm and and see how you do and, yeah. and see what it's like a lot of people that i've played with that would never normally play people we brought along actually quite surprised themselves they're like i didn't realize i'd be so confident girls are really good yeah girls are really good at airsoft very sneaky so sneaky and better trigger so, discipline way better trigger discipline <laughs> yep um yeah all the guys tend to run in and the girls are just that little bit like slower and they sort of Methodical. yeah they sort of perceive the battlefield a bit better than men on their first attempt anyway or like on the first few tries yeah you know <clears throat> guys can learn we can get better um, <laughs> we can learn from the ladies um, but yeah girls tend to be really good um, I think it's they have a I'm sort of maybe I'm projecting but the one thing that girls normally ask more than anything is oh, how much does it hurt or mm. how much more is it going to hurt so I think, whereas guys are more interested in kind of like the guns and stuff. Yeah. And I think that natural hesitance of this is going to hurt means that they're that little bit slower. And whereas the guys more running forward being like, I really want to shoot my gun. Mm -hmm. The girls hesitating a bit more means that actually all the guys would be running to their sights and they 
they just pick us off and we're like I didn't see you behind that barrel <laughs> and you know and you're like oh in, in all fairness the the hesitation of pain might warrant to be fair quite it probably warrants a more realistic response to that sort of scenario mm. to be like oh I really don't want to get shot I would say you play with more anticipation if you really don't like pain and you really don't want to get shot because that's probably reflective of real life <laughs> or you know a, a real scenario which, it, yeah it probably is and um, I think they play it you know anyone who doesn't want to get shot or is scared of pain is the amount of times that I've run into a room first knowing yeah. that there's three or four people aiming guns at the doorway yeah been, all I've got to do is get in clear the sort of doorway and as long as, like, if I could get one shot or two shots on target and take one of those people out, and maybe the person behind me can get past me into the room and take one person out, then the next time when we breach the room, we've only got two people instead of four people. Mm -hmm. And it's that, like, rinse and repeat that you don't get in real steel, no. I guess. Um, but it does, and but you have to kind of force it. Yeah. Whereas, you, I guess, some people are obviously less keen uh, to do that. Yeah. Um, Whereas I'm just like, nah, come on, in, in for the action. Like, I'm here to get shot um, and, and shoot mm -hmm. and, and do all of that. You know, I want to be involved in every part of that. So mm -hmm. That's the thing, you don't get that on a flat range, whether it be airsoft, air rifles, real steel. No, you, don't you don't get that on a flat range. No, you just don't. It's not one of those things that you ever come across. No. <clears throat> that's why we love airsoft, isn't it? That's why it's so good. And yeah, that's it. It's not just the modding part, the modding part of it or the game part of it or the tactics, or the learning new things. Mm -hmm. It's like making new friends. It's like, for me, it's been like obviously a massive support network, um, especially with everything going on at the moment. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been everything. It's been, and for me, for more than half my life, I've been mm. so into airsoft, 25 years now, I guess I've been into yeah. airsoft since I was 15, now 40. It's a long time, um, and you think, in that time that you probably get quite bored of something but i just haven't it's right. just always new things coming out <clears throat> new it's just that it, it gives so much mm -hmm. and that there is so much to do and so much to interest you or to interest me anyway but i just i'm going to just keep coming back to airsoft i can't get enough of it yeah i think it's the best um, but anyway thank you um alex from the discord for for joining me Anytime. and for this extended chat just about general airsoft stuff um hopefully you've enjoyed this um i certainly have um <laughs> i'm pretty hungry i'm gonna maybe get some food now uh but yeah thank you once again alex yeah, and, thank you. um yeah hopefully we'll see you on the next video take care do you see this is screwed in i did well. yeah it's like i did move it and it's pretty solid and it let it just yeah. you know, the edge of this table and that I like put an end the reverse barrel over it and like clamped it yeah. down honestly I'm so happy to have a vice I know it makes such a difference it was I can't remember how much I think it was like 22 pounds yeah honestly I wish I bought one years ago I know I really do if we had one in 53 it would have made things oh because so the amount of things that where you need three hands yeah. to do it yeah and just having a vice that you can clamp down. Drilling shit, like. Oh, just everything, honestly. Um, How wide is it? Uh, Quite. It does enough, enough that it'll hold a receiver, yeah. basically. And the thing is, because of I've got it on this edge of the tape, of this edge of the cabinet, if I swing the cabinet round, it points out of the doorway into the other bedroom at the back wall. Mm. So for doing like any sort of testing on pistol accuracy or anything like that, also don't have a lot of range to test with, mm. but this can clamp onto the torch. Nice. And because we've got type B torches um, for the X300s. It's pretty secure. Uh, yeah, it will secure on, and you can then obviously test the accuracy of the gun. But the only problem is, yeah, I just don't have, what is that, like 30 feet? Yeah, if you push it back. Yeah, if I put this a little bit further back, I might get 30 feet out of it, which is not really enough to be testing like proper accuracy. It's not, everything's going to be kind of all right within that range, isn't it? Unless it's really bad. Unless it's really, really bad. So like any of the Tanakas will probably struggle, but I don't really want to clamp any of them. I mean, I guess I've got some like rags that I can use. 
But when I clamped that Mac 11, I did get some blue paint on it. I did see, yeah, I missed that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's from me clamping it and just not... <clears throat> yeah, again, being overexcited. As we all are. And just getting on with it rather than taking that moment to think about what I'm doing. Mm. And I thought about this enough to like get it so that I can have the cabinet next to my desk so that it's all like tucked in level as much as it can be. Mm. Screwed in like pretty much level on this bit here. Yeah. But tightened it first, then screwed it so that it's all held in yeah. and it doesn't split or anything like that. So you can pick that cabinet up using the, that vice, yeah. Even though it looks like it's sort of pitched ever so slightly with this extra bit. It just means that it's, um, it is, yeah. It, for airsoft, certainly solid enough. Yeah. And for, yeah, like the under 25 pounds that it cost me to buy, I just literally got it from a local shop up the road. Mm. So, again, support local, you know, as much as you can. Yeah. Well, it makes sense, you know, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you support your local? the local stores mm. otherwise they disappear and then you just got empty high streets and there's just nothing on them and when you're like oh I just want to pop out and grab yeah. an allen key in this size because like all mine are bent or I've lost them or whatever you, you can't just go into you go oh great I guess you could get like Amazon next day delivery but when you're in the middle of something can't and you're like I could just pop to the shop that's two minutes away grab it come back and just like bang get it done you can't depend on Amazon though because it's like <clears> you know, the weird sellers that they get they're just not dependable to be like, oh, I could buy that again, because the next day it'll be like, gone. They just stopped mm. selling it, they've stopped offering it, they've stopped their Amazon account, whatever. Yeah, that's like very true. Like a dedicated shop is like, well, what we do is that. Yeah, that's our thing. Yeah, what we always sell is like, tools, vices. Plus, I feel like, giving money to Amazon is like, I love it, I love Prime. Yeah. But I always hate it every time I do it, I'm like, that's just like another 20 quid, we just give them to it. Jeff. Jeff Bezos, yeah, that's it. It's... I tend to use eBay a lot more. eBay is good. E eBay is yeah. good because you are just buying off like an People. individual for the for the most part. I, mean, I guess there are eBay shops and stuff which can be all right. Even so, though, they're not like huge. Do you know what no. I mean? Like as yeah, some think? of them, some yeah. Or Amazon is like as well. Amazon is like drop shipping central. But the thing is, I love picking up secondhand stuff like it's like it. EOTechs and things like that. Like the best place to find them second hand is, is, is still eBay yeah um, or I guess Facebook marketplace but I don't really go on Facebook I'm not really a Facebook less user. so for airsoft shit I don't think you can sell riffs on there anyway no I know That's there's awesome. some like real steel like sales and advice and stuff and there are you can buy you can buy and sell some stuff but certainly, yeah, no riffs. That's where the Discord and stuff comes in, doesn't it? Yeah. And you've, where it came you've from. got like the Tokyo Marine Gas Blowback Discord. You've got the um, Heavy Recall Club Discord as well. They do a lot of buying, selling, like reviewing upgrades. Um, but obviously, the Heavy Recall one goes across like GHKs and VFCs and they do TM and obviously yeah. and stuff like that as well but they'll cross guys. all the platforms whereas the TM one is just a dedicated yeah there is like a channel for other things but that's more so if we, we got into <coughs> it first through MWSs and just want to try with it everyone's been so sweet it's been yeah. really nice apart from one dude who was very sweet to you so sent you a very nice message and on the video we recorded said lol that guy's weird I did hear one story on there of a couple that apparently met in my comment section. No, oh my god! And they've like, yeah, Hit like years ago met just from yeah commenting on a video. Oh, wow. <laughs> Both were like got chatting in the comments, realised that they were from the same place, and ended up met meeting up, and they're engaged apparently. Oh. Which is insane. Is so incredible. congratulations to them. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's insane. And to be fair, I've had a bunch of people comment as well and say that they want to try airsoft and they want to get into airsoft. Mm -hmm. And that genuinely makes me happier than anything, anything else. Like nothing makes me because it's like given me so much that the thought that it could now give to other people is just. 
amazing. Yeah. And some people that have said that they used to like play when they were kids and stopped playing and they've kind of got you know got back together with old school friends and gone out for a game and stuff like that. Like that that's that cool. makes me really happy. Like yeah. that's that's amazing. You wouldn't have thought that something like that would just come of what's been going on. It's just insane. I'll probably have to close that window I reckon because that is quite annoying.